Ball. It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Liberals' members have a choice today, especially the members from Mississauga, Vaughan, Brampton, York, and Durham regions. They can choose to publicly stand with the best interest of their constituents. They can choose to stand for affordability, and they can choose to stand against tolls in Toronto, or they can choose to defend a tax and spend premier, a premier who is out of touch with the challenges of working commuters, who can't afford to pay another $1,000 a year. Mr. Speaker, what choice will Liberal members make, and will the premier, Mr. Speaker, allow her members to freely vote on the motion before the House today? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And before we get into the cut and thrust, I just want to uh, wish everyone in this House and everyone in the gallery and the people of Ontario a very happy holiday time, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Whatever they celebrate, I want to wish them a Merry Christmas, a Happy Kwanzaa, a Happy Hanukkah, Happy Diwali. Whatever their uh, whatever their celebration, Mr. Speaker, I hope that people have a chance to spend time with friends and family. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I will say to the uh, to the leader of the opposition, you know, there are there are different ways of uh, of doing politics. I believe yes, that it's are. very important that government and that all politicians think about the long term, Mr. Speaker, at the same time that they think about the day to day, making sure that the decisions we make uh, have a, a positive impact on people in their day to day lives. But at the same time, we plan for the future, Mr. Speaker, and we make investments that are going to make prosperity possible in the future, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. In the 2014 provincial election, the Premier promised the largest infrastructure program in our province's history. We're still waiting. We haven't seen any of those results from municipalities across the province. In 2015, the Premier announced the fire sale. Stop the clock, please. Uh, as all of you know, um, I've been struggling with my voice. Uh, it doesn't mean that I still can't get your attention in other means. Uh, even on the last day, if it's required, I'll move into warnings. And yesterday, I even told you it got to a point where I might even move to naming, which is very unorthodox. If I need to apply that, I will do that. I insist on making this as calm as possible, with or without your help. Finish your question, please. Mr. Speaker, in 2015, the Premier promised the fire sale of Hydro One that would go towards infrastructure. Not a single cent has gone towards infrastructure. And then last week, the Auditor General's report showed the Liberals a stunning level of incompetence when it came to managing our infrastructure dollars. You know, it revealed the government is spending infrastructure dollars irresponsibly. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is this. Will the Premier come clean to the legislature and question. say the only reason we're considering tolls in Toronto is because of this government's waste, scandal and mismanagement? Yeah. Yeah. The member from Glengarry, Prussett Russell, will come to order. The Minister of Infrastructure will come to order, and those last two heckles uh, are forcing me to say we're now moving to warnings. You do not understand my resolve. I'll make it happen. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, um, just on the issue of uh, the vote this afternoon, uh, private members' business, there are free votes. My members will vote the way they, they choose to, Mr. Speaker, and that's always the case. Um, yeah. the, uh, I like that member. I like member. To, to go back? To go back to the, the importance of long-term thinking, Mr. Speaker, you know, I think that decisions have to be made on principle. The principle that we are operating on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, is that we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to build roads and bridges and transit, Mr. Speaker. It's extremely important that we do that. And the other principle that we operate with, Mr. Speaker, is that 
provincial government must have a respect for municipal government, Mr. Speaker, that local decision-making is important. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, you know, many of us are here on this side of the House, many of us are here because a previous government did not respect local government, did not pay attention to municipalities, Mr. Speaker, and we're not going to go down that road. We have a deep respect for local government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier, the Premier did not answer my question of whether th these tolls are to pay for the waste and mismanagement. Right. It's like the government's oblivious to the AG's report, oblivious to the irresponsible management of infrastructure dollars. So let me remind the Premier, the government gave out $8 million in bonuses to companies paving our roads, despite the fact that companies falsified the quality of the work. This is the government that paid $23 million for highway repairs after three years, despite the fact the roads were supposed to last for 15 years. This is a government that rewarded a company with a $39 million contract, despite they built a bridge upside down. Shame. This is not a government Shame. that should be introducing new taxes or tolls. Shame. Mr. Speaker, one— The Minister of Finance is warned. The member from Leeds-Grenville is warned. The member from the Minister of Transportation is warned. Anyone else? Thank you. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, the AG's report was black and white. This Question. infrastructure spending has been irresponsible. Will the Premier tell the House today these tolls are only coming to pay for your incredible incompetence on infrastructure yeah. spending? Mr. Speaker, the, you know, the billions of dollars that we are investing in infrastructure across the GTHA, across the province, Mr. Speaker, building roads and bridges and transit, are creating 110,000 jobs a year, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, I, I really, I understand why politically. Well, I sort of understand why politically the leader of the opposition would um, would invoke this kind of short-term tactic. But in the long run, Mr. Speaker, if we as a government, if we as a society do not invest in the infrastructure that this province needs, then we will not prosper. We will not be able to provide the jobs for the young people who are the pages today, Mr. Speaker. We will not be able to provide for the prosperity and the innovation in this province that we know is possible. Answer. So I'm going to leave short-term thinking to the opposition. We are in this for the long haul to invest in Ontario's future. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from the P and Carleton is warned. Anyone else want to make their last comment? New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The approval of these tolls, these taxes on the DVP and the Gardner, is not just harmful to the 905, it's harmful to the 416. City staff in Toronto reported— Excuse me, stop the clock. <clears throat> The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation will withdraw. I withdraw. Warned. Finish. Mr. Speaker, city staff in Toronto reported that congestion on main city streets surrounding the DVP and the Gardiner will increase by as much as 29 per cent. So you've got more cars on city streets. It's going to cause more gridlock, more traffic in the 416. The gridlock on Lakeshore Boulevard, the Queensway, Victoria Park, Danforth and Kingston will make life more, more difficult for drivers in the City of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier doing this to the City of Toronto? Why is she doing this to the 905? This is not the Christmas present that Question. commuters in Toronto need. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, you know, we covered uh, this ground yesterday. We covered this ground a number of days ago. We've covered this ground repeatedly as the Leader of the Opposition has brought forward these kinds of very, as the Premier said, very short-sighted questions, Speaker. Uh, it could not be more uh, abundantly clear that this Premier and our government understand the importance of making sure that we are investing and at the same time that we're partnering with municipalities. It is, Speaker, at the end of the day, it is the only way for us to make sure that we continue to move the province forward, Speaker. 
And for the life of me, for the life of me, given the evidence that we have in front of us, I can't understand why that leader doesn't get it, Speaker, because the member from Niagara, West Glanbrook, is warned. Not the way I wanted to end it. This is the way you're ending it. Finish, please, Minister. As I was saying, everyone on this side of the House understands how important it is to make sure that we continue to partner with all levels of government, particularly our municipal partners, Speaker. Premier Kathleen Wynne understands that. Everyone on our side understands that. And certainly, Speaker, former Mayor Hazel McCallion understands that. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier. The Premier is opening a dangerous box. It could create a war of tolls. What if the Mayor of Mississauga, Bonnie Crombie, who has said that she wants to share the revenue for drivers from Toronto going to the airport, if the Mayor of Mississauga asked the Premier for a toll? I can keep getting up. The Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. Mr. Speaker, if the mayor of Mississauga, who said that Mississauga deserves some revenue for Toronto drivers going to the airport, if they ask for a toll, you've given provincial permission to the city of Toronto. Are you going to say no to the city of Mississauga? And they shake their heads. This can't happen without provincial permission. They are giving provincial permission. Will you give it to Mississauga? Durham is against this. If they, if they want a toll, you're going to give it to Durham. Markham has said this is taxation without representation. Where does this end? Mr. Speaker, my question is very clear question. to the Premier. If Mississauga asks for a toll, if Durham asks for a toll, if Markham asks for a toll, will you say yes like you have to Toronto? Thank you. The member from Etobicoke Lakeshore is warned. The member from Halliburton Gortha Lakes is warned. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I, I noticed that the member talks about the war of the tolls. Let's talk about the war of the quotes, Speaker, instead of the war of the tolls. So here I have a quote, I and I quote, I applaud the Wynn government and Metrolinx for their commitment to ensure Mississauga receives important infrastructure investments and is at the heart of our plan to build an extensively, extensive regionally integrated transit network, Speaker. That's from Mayor of Mississauga, Bonnie Crombie. Speaker, in addition to that, that leader was in Durham. He mentioned Durham just a second ago, not that long ago, August 29th of this year, Speaker, when he said, and if there's a resolution of council saying that this is a top priority, then government should try to work with our municipal partners to respect municipal wishes, Speaker. He said when he was at Flamborough, my approach to infrastructure on a municipal level is this. We have to trust our local partners. You have to work with your local partners, Speaker, as much as possible. Yes, I'm sir. going to try to defer to the decisions of local council, Speaker. This wasn't 10 years ago. It wasn't 20 years ago. It was this year, Speaker. This Thank is you. what that leader said at that time. And today, he's changed his Thank you. Mr. Speaker, these are diversion tactics. That was on new builds, on infrastructure. Give me a break. So, Mr. Speaker. Come to order, please. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. <clears throat> Finish, please. Mr. Speaker. My question directly to the Premier. You could start a war of the tolls. You have said if Toronto asks for it, you'll give them provincial permission. So the question is, the mayor of Mississauga said she deserves revenue from drivers from Toronto going to the airport. The mayor of Markham has said essentially the same thing for drivers leaving Toronto. So my question to the Premier, and please don't avoid answering the question. If Mississauga asks for a toll like the City of Toronto has done, will you give special provincial permission like you're doing for Toronto? Yes or no? Are you going to start a war of the tolls? Be honest with the people of Ontario. For once, just be honest and answer the question. Yes. Be seated, please. Thank you. 
The member from Beaches East York is warned. If I saw who said that, I'd warn them too. Very disappointing. Minister. <laughs> Speaker, thanks very much. I, I guess I can kind of understand why the leader of the Conservative Party gets upset. I, I guess I can understand why he gets upset, Speaker, when it's uncomfortable for him to hear his own words of only a few months ago yeah. thrown back at him, Speaker. <laughs> and then in his final question, he gets up and suggests that his own words are our diversionary tactics, Speaker. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really get it, Speaker. I, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know who's writing the material on that side of the House, Speaker. I really don't understand it at all. I don't understand it at all, Speaker. I, <clears throat> You're nice, <everybody. clears throat> here's what the people on this side of the House, here's what every municipal partner we have, and here's what the people of this region know, Speaker. We are building transit. The last time he and his ilk had a chance, Speaker, they sold the 407. Speaker, they sold it. Today it's told they was told then and they sold it. At the same time, the Answer. Edmonton subway, Speaker, they didn't just kill it, they killed it and filled it. The only thing they're fond of saying is how they wouldn't build transit. And we are, Speaker. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. If I may, I'd like to, on behalf of New Democrats, our caucus, as well as New Democrats around the province, wish all MPPs, all political staff and legislative staff, uh, members of the media gallery, Speaker, and all Ontarians uh, a happy and safe holiday season, as well as a prosperous new year. Uh, my question, Speaker, is for the Premier. All across this province, people have an incredible desire to build a better Ontario and have a better future for our next generations. But instead of it getting easier to build a future here, it's getting harder. A good job with benefits is harder to find. People are being treated in hospitals that are overcrowded, dangerously overcrowded, and students are going to schools that are literally crumbling. Why is this Premier ignoring these problems? and letting them get even worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, I absolutely agree with the uh, leader of the third party that people across this province want to see our province built up, Mr. Speaker. They want to see that bright future. So, to that end, here are the things that we have been doing, Mr. Speaker. We're making university and college tuition free for middle and low income students, Mr. Speaker, starting in September 2017. 150,000 students. We're taking the HST off electricity bills. That will provide savings to families and businesses throughout the province. We understand there's more to be done, Mr. Speaker, but this will help. We've made retirement security a priority, and we were able to reach a national agreement on the enhancement of the Canada Pension Plan, Mr. Speaker. We're doubling the land transfer tax rebate for first-time home buyers. We're investing historic amounts in child care to create another 100,000 child care spaces, Mr. Speaker. That will make a huge difference Answer. for families, who's, uh, particularly mothers, who want to go back to work, Mr. Speaker. Those are the things that we're doing that are building this province, Mr. Speaker. Response. You see the please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what's clear is that this Premier promised to set the reset button, and it just didn't happen. Right. Instead, we continue to see a Liberal government that's more interested in helping the little Liberal Party than the people of Ontario, a government whose focus is not on good jobs with benefit, uh, benefits, a government that stubbornly refuses to stop the sell-off of Hydro One, that continues to neglect the crises that we see in our hospitals and in our schools. When is this government going to start listening to the people of Ontario and get its priorities straight? So, Mr. Speaker, you know, um, the, uh, the leader of the third party suggests that somehow there's a partisan bent to, uh, to the results that we're seeing in the province because of the investments that we're making. I can say, Mr. Speaker, the past, in the past year, the 100,000 jobs that have been created across the province, Mr. Speaker, most of those people probably have no political affiliation, Mr. Speaker, but they have jobs because of the investments, because of the work that we're doing in this province. Our 
unemployment rate is at its lowest level in eight years, Mr. Speaker. That means people across the province are benefiting from that. Now, I know. I know that there are regional differences and there are demographic differences, so young people, uh, we need to make sure that more young people have opportunities. But, Mr. Speaker, we are leading the country. We're one of the leading jurisdictions in the country in terms of the unemployment rate, Mr. Speaker, and in terms of our GDP. You have a sentence wrap up, please. First half of this year, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, GDP growth in Ontario outstripped that of Canada, wow. the U.S., and almost all G7 countries. What we're doing is working here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Speaker, what the Premier didn't talk about is how she just, without any notice, got rid of sick leave and bereavement leave for a lot of workers here in the province of Ontario. I'm sure people aren't happy to hear about that. People across Ontario are disappointed, Speaker. I'm sure the Premier has heard it, and I'm certain Liberal MPPs have heard it as well. In fact, Liberal staff in this gallery have heard it as well. People, well, people were hopeful, Speaker. We're hopeful that the Premier would change, that things would change. But she hasn't changed a thing, and people are now at a She's breaking point. They can only take so much, Speaker. This is the last day of the Legislature in this year of 2016. Will this Premier commit to changing course and start listening to the real concerns that the people have of their province and where it's headed? Well, again, Mr. Speaker, you know, I'm, I am happy to debate um, the, the realities of what uh, are going on in the province and the realities of what we are doing. So uh, the, uh, the leader of the third party talks about an adjustment that was made in terms of personal emergency leave and says that we're getting rid of personal emergency leave and bereavement leave. That's just not true, Mr. Speaker. That is not what is happening. There is an adjustment that is being made, but 10 days is staying as 10 days, Mr. Speaker. It'll be seven and three. And so if the leader of the third party wants to talk about what's really going on in Ontario, wants to talk about the protections that we are putting in place for people, Mr. Speaker, wants to talk about the fact that 85.5 per cent of kids are graduating from high school, wants to talk about the fact that we have the shortest wait times in the country, Mr. Speaker. If she wants to talk about those things and then talk about what more we can do, I'm happy to have that discussion. But let's deal with the truth, Mr. Speaker. Seated. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is for the Premier as well. Here's a dose of the truth. People in Hamilton, Brantford, Brant are going to hospitals that are dangerously overcrowded because of liberal cuts and underfunding to our hospitals. The Auditor General said it is unsafe for hospitals to be filled beyond 85 per cent. So does the OECD. But this government has no policy on what level of occupancy is safe and has no policies or plans to deal with dangerous overcrowding in Ontario's hospitals. How's that for a dose of reality? Does the Premier even believe that it's unsafe for hospitals to be, uh, be filled beyond 85 per cent? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, it may be her reality, but it's not the truth. Oh, so here's why, here's why I'm so disappointed with the leader of the third party. Yesterday on CP24, she said, and I quote, we have 60 percent of our hospitals operating at more than 100 percent occupancy. That's not true, Mr. Speaker. Here's what the Auditor General said. And she was only looking at medicine wards, not all wards and hospitals. She said last fiscal year, 60 per cent of medicine wards in Ontario's large community hospitals had occupancy rates higher than 85 per cent. Completely different. And, Mr. Speaker, just to Whoa. add to, hopefully, to adjust her reality so she can wow. honestly portray to Ontarians what the facts are. Currently, with the most recent information, only one hospital out of more than 150 in the province Answer. is currently over capacity, wow. Mr. Speaker. Three wow. percent, one hospital. 
seated, please. Be seated, please. <clears throat> I'm not. Uh, I'm not actually very happy about that at all. I would ask and advise everyone that we stay away from the unparliamentary accusations that I know you all are aware of. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, as per my question, this government refuses to acknowledge what capacity is or isn't. And this, this minister thinks that a 100 per cent capacity is appropriate when we know the AG says it is not, the OECD says it is not, and it is not good for the people of Ontario. Shame on him that he likes hallway medicine in this province. Shame on him. All across Northern Ontario, Speaker, hospitals are filled to beyond safe levels. People in Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay are being put at risk because of overcrowded hospitals. Those are the facts. Can this Premier and her minister tell people in Ontario, explain to them why their hospitals are overcrowded and why the Liberal government doesn't have any policies or any plans to stop the overcrowding in our hospitals? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, we have challenges in our health care system, and I will be the first to admit it. But it is such a disservice to our frontline health care workers to the Ontario Hospital Association, to those administrators that work so hard day in and out. I admit that there is much more work to be done, but I think we all owe it when we're speaking in this legislature, when we're speaking to Ontarians, that we speak the truth, Mr. Speaker. And for the member opposite to go on live, to go on television, live television yesterday and state 60 per cent of our hospitals are operating at more than 100 per cent occupancy. When the truth, Mr. Speaker, from the AG herself is she says 60 per cent of our medicine wards in our large community hospitals are at 85 per cent capacity Answer. or higher, and the most recent data shows that a single hospital out of more than 150 Thank is you. over capacity, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplement. How dare this minister, just like the premier last year, last yesterday on question period? I, uh, I would ask all members to just kind of tone it down. All members, and I don't need armchair quarterbacks to tell me when it's too loud. This is really not the way I think anyone would really want us to end this session, really. Please finish. How dare they shift the blame onto the frontline workers in the hospital, Speaker? That is a shameful thing. Registered nurses in this province are ending their shifts in tears, sobbing because they can't provide the health care they know they should be providing to the people of this province because of the cuts that this government has made to our hospitals and to our nurses and to our frontline health care workers. For more than two years, two and a half years, Brampton Civic Hospital has been overcrowded. Crowded. Mississauga Hospital and Credit Valley Hospital are regularly above 90 per cent capacity. I don't know what this minister is talking about. Those are the facts. Sometimes they're above 100 per cent. How many patients in Brampton, Mississauga, Question. have been treated in a hallway, ended up with an infection, came home from hospital sicker than when they went in because this government has no policies and they have no plans to deal with the overcrowding in our hospitals. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, we'll just uh, 
have to agree to disagree. She says, you say 90 out of 150 hospitals are at over 100 percent capacity. I am saying it's one. Out of 150. The public can choose who to believe. I can provide the facts from the most recent quarter that demonstrate that truth, Mr. Speaker. The NDP, unless perhaps she's thinking about when they were in power, when they closed 24 percent of hospital beds across this province. That would be understandable, Mr. Speaker. But the Auditor General also said that nine out of ten people going to emergency are discharged within the provincial and the national allocate the wow. national target wait times, Mr. Speaker. The Fraser Institute and the Wait Time Alliance have consistently ranked Ontario as having some of the shortest wait times in Canada. We have the shortest wait times in Canada for MRIs, for CTs, for ultrasounds. We should be proud of the health care system that the Conference Board of Canada ranked as the seventh best in the world, Mr. Speaker, ahead of Japan, ahead of Germany, ahead of the United Kingdom, ahead of the United States. Yes, we should be proud of that. We should be proud of our frontline health care workers not spreading these mistruths and not discouraging our children. Dr. please. The minister will withdraw. <laughs> have to have your mic on. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. Merry Christmas, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, it is the season of giving, and, but some gifts we receive are unwanted. Bill 41 yesterday delivered the gift of another layer of bureaucracy and increased red tape for our frontline health care professionals. With the bloated bureaucracy and mountains of red tape, this bill reversed the government's previous intentions and shifted the power away from local decision-making back to the Ministry of Health. Mr. Speaker, why did the government not listen to health care professionals and patients and present Ontarians with this health care lump of coal? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, it was a proud moment yesterday in the Legislature when we did pass the Patients First Act, which makes a transformation that not only reduces bureaucracy, and I don't understand how the member opposite, when we when we eliminate the CCACs, when we eliminate the boards that run the CCACs and integrate that into the LINs. I know the member opposite wants to get rid of the LINs. I happen to believe in the 10 years that they've been here, a local boards, local decision-making, that they've worked closely with our hospitals, with our long-term care facilities, with home and community care, with our mental health and addictions agencies. This bill allows them to coordinate that care better, as well as work with primary care providers, work with public health, and, as I mentioned, integrate the home and community care services into their functions. Mr. Speaker. I'm proud of this bill. And in the Supplementary. It's not simply that I'm proud. I'm going to talk about individuals who are also proud uh, that represent the frontline workers. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and back to the minister. Minister, the opposition parties of this legislature presented 73 amendments before committee in relation to Bill 41. These amendments came from those who deliver health care firsthand and who are worried that patient care will suffer under this bill. One of those communities was the Francophone community. Monsieur le Président, la communauté franco-ontarienne composée de plus de 600 000 The francophone community, composed of millions of citizens, is very worried about French language services being delivered in the health care sector. They will not be not denied home care services in French. Thank you. Well, of course, Mr. Speaker, I'll provide that assurance and commitment, and I've worked extremely hard since the moment I became health minister to make sure we not only meet our responsibility to Franco-Ontarians, to those who, to, to Francophones in this province who want to and deserve to and, and have the right to expect to receive their services uh, in the French language. Uh, I work to exceed that commitment and that responsibility under the French Language Services Act. In fact, that act is specifically referenced in the Patients First Act. I have 
have my own council, which is a French language health services advisory council. I took their advice. They, we incorporated it into the bill as we were drafting, and they expressed their 100 percent satisfaction. And these are individuals who not only represent the Francophone community in this province, but they are leaders in the health field and advocates for patients. Right, I sir. took their advice. I'm working very closely with the commissioner as well. We'll continue to work to ensure that responsibility is exceeded. Thank you. Here, here. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Premier. A new report released this week state families will spend an extra $420 on groceries and dining out next year. Food prices overall are expected to, in to rise between 3 and 5 per cent for basics like meat and vegetables. With too many Ontarians already living in energy poverty, thanks to the callous policies of this government, my question to the Premier is, how many Ontario families need to live in energy poverty and now food poverty before this government cares enough to take action? When is enough going to be enough? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I'm, I'm pleased to rise and speak about uh, the programs that we've put in place to help those families that are struggling with their electricity bill, Mr. Speaker, that are um, you know, having, uh, having a difficult time. And I know the Premier uh, has recognized that and has said that we're going to continue to act, Mr. Speaker, and that's what I've been doing since I've taken over um, almost six months now as Minister of Energy. You know, Mr. Speaker, just go back to the speech from the throne a few months back. We brought forward an 8 percent reduction for all families across uh, across the province, so small businesses, families and family farms will receive that 8 percent reduction come January 1st, Mr. Speaker. That's just a few weeks away. That is something that they can look forward to. And those families that are still struggling, Mr. Speaker, we have many programs that are out there for them to utilize. I do hope um, that those families uh, contact their local utilities, contact some of the social services agencies that are out there to get access to these programs. The Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, is just one of those programs that helps many of those families. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. This report makes it clear that things are only getting harder for families in Ontario. Sylvain Charlebois, the report's lead author, warned, quote, those living in Ontario and BC should be prepared for above average food inflation around 4 to 5 per cent. With this government still stubbornly digging its heels in and pursuing the sale of Hydro One and families forced to make impossible decisions between paying for food or hydro, my question to the Premier is, this holiday, will this Premier stop stealing the dignity of Ontario families and telling them that she will make their lives more affordable by stopping the sale of Hydro One? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, once again, in relation to um, all of the programs that we've put in place, we are helping many of those families that are out there. The Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, has helped 145,000 families already. We're actually uh, doing as much as we can to get more people signed up to this program to help these families, especially during this time of year, Mr. Speaker. We know how important that is. But when it comes to the sale of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, and the broadening of the ownership, just yesterday. Um, it, the example of, of the reasons why we're doing this is to build infrastructure and to make the company a better customer-focused company, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday. yesterday, they reconnected, Mr. Speaker, 1,400 families that have been disconnected. 1400. That is just an example, Mr. Speaker, of this company changing and being broader-based, yes, ensuring that it can help people, and that will make sure that they can get into a payment plan, Mr. Speaker, and moving forward uh, as, as this, uh, this company Thank continues you. to grow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Energy, the Honourable Glenn Thibault. On one of the essential goals for this government, that is making everyday life more affordable for Ontarians. And while Ontario's economy, Speaker, is doing well, as we appreciate, not every family is seeing that impact on their personal day-to-day -day budgets. And perhaps nowhere is that challenge more pressing than on the issue of hydro rates. And as the Premier indicated, 
helping Ontarians with the cost of everyday living is a top priority for our government. In the speech from the throne from this, this fall, Speaker, as you'll appreciate, the government announced new measures to curb the cost of electricity for Ontario homes as well as businesses, and these measures will take effect on January 1, 2017. Speaker, Question. could the minister please inform this House on a somewhat uh, more detail about the measures from the throne speech that will lower electricity costs for Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I also want to thank the uh, member from Etobicoke North for that question and all for his hard work uh, in this House as well, Mr. Speaker. So over the past decade, Mr. Speaker, um, our electricity system has been transformed from a dirty, aging system to one that is clean and reliable, Mr. Speaker, and that transformation was for the better. But the cost of this transition, Mr. Speaker, have presented a challenge for some Ontarians, and that's why this fall, we took action, Mr. Speaker. We passed legislation which, beginning January 1st, which is only a couple of weeks away, will provide an 8 per cent rebate for every, every family, farm and small business in this province, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, we will also introduce additional support for the most rural parts of our province and expand the programs for businesses. Speaker, we're proud of the work that we've done to turn our province into a leader when it comes Thanks, to sir. clean, reliable electricity, and that's why we're now acting, Mr. Speaker, to make this as affordable as possible for as many people as we can. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Je voudrais vous remercier pour votre réponse. Thank you for your answer, Minister programs will be a significant step and very well received for the families and businesses and, of course, across the province. The 8 per cent rebate will help to curb electricity costs for Ontarians across the board, while other programs will provide the type of support that keeps our province fair as well as competitive. Speaker, I understand the measures from the speech from the throne are just a few of the many actions the minister has taken and will take to further reduce the cost of electricity. And as he's been in office for just a short time, I believe that the minister has been devoted and diligent in executing this government's commitments. Speaker, would the minister please share with this house some of the other initiatives that our government is taking to lower the cost of electricity in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Good question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and once again, thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for that question. So, Speaker, on top of the direct support to ratepayers provided through the speech from the throne, our government has been hard at working to find ways to remove costs from the electricity system. So, back in September, Mr. Speaker, we announced that we would suspend further procurement of large renewable generation. This announcement will avoid almost $4 billion, Mr. Speaker, in cost to the system. In October, we finalized a deal with Quebec to increase and improve our electricity trade, making better use of our system and saving ratepayers $70 million in the process, Mr. Speaker. And I've been in constant conversation with our partners in the sector, from our agencies to stakeholders to poverty and business advocates, discussing ways to save yet more money for the ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am committed to lowering costs for Ontario ratepayers, whether it's 50 cents or $50. I will continue to do everything I can to find reductions and ensure electricity is affordable across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week, the Auditor General tabled her annual report, which further confirmed the Liberal government's stunning incompetence in managing our problems. Yeah. Speaker, the Auditor General's report tells us that to get a bed at Ontario Shores Mental Health Centre, patients with the same diagnosis in 2015-2016 waited three weeks longer than five years ago, and those with borderline personality disorders who waited about a month and a half in 2011-2012 for outpatient services are now waiting seven months. My question to the Premier is this. How can she continue to defend the outrageous increases in wait times that have happened under her government's watch? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I particularly appreciated this chapter in the Auditor General's report uh, that helped uh, point the way for us to identify challenges uh, in our mental health system, specifically as it pertains to uh, our hospitals that provide that uh, acute care for those with mental health and addictions. Uh, and, um, and she highlights areas that we need to continue to make improvements. For example, she talks about standards of care. Health Quality Ontario has already developed three standards of care in mental health for uh, dementia, 
for schizophrenia uh, that will uh, allow our health care providers in our hospitals to follow best practices. Uh, we've, with regards to Ontario Shores Mental Health uh, Hospital, I was particularly proud when we made the uh, recent investment to open up beds specifically for individuals with eating disorders. We've increased the budget of the hospital by $2 million uh, this year as well. They're operating Thank by you. Mr. Speaker. Supplement. Uh, back to the Premier. Speaker, I've asked the Premier previously about cutbacks at Ontario Shores, and my questions have been met with uh, liberal spin from the Health Minister. That's it. And as the clock mercifully runs out on this government, the fact is its legacy of unprecedented scandal, waste, and mismanagement has led to cuts to services Ontarians rely on. Since the Premier didn't answer my first question, perhaps she will answer this one. Will the Premier fire her health minister for the sake of patients at Ontario Shores? I'm not sure if I should be the one answering this, this part of the question, Mr. Speaker. Just say no. But uh, no, I'm hearing a no. But uh, Mr. Speaker, we. Um, you know, we recognize when it comes to uh, mental health and addictions that there is a lot more work to be done, but I'm proud of the investments that we've made uh, in uh, CAMH and Ontario Shores and the Royal, which is in Ottawa and, and Waypoint. Uh, we've made substantial new investments uh, in those hospitals. Uh, and in, in fact, I need to mention that because the MPP for Barrie is, is here, is there now? I can see her. I was recently in in Barrie just a couple of weeks ago, where we opened a brand new, or rather, we announced the a brand new inpatient and outpatient youth and child mental health unit, which will be providing a number of inpatient beds at the Royal Vic in Barrie, Answer. as well as being able to serve more than 3,000 individuals on a daily basis. These are the kinds of investments that we are making. We know we have to not only reduce and eliminate the stigma, we need to invest more money. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. While this government sits idly by and makes excuses, the rising price of electricity continues to make life more difficult for our most vulnerable citizens. The downtown mission in Windsor used to serve about 1,100 people a month. Now they serve 800 a week. Wow. It seems this is the only business that's ex that expands as hydro prices soar. Speaker, will this government admit that their token hydro rebate is too little too late, that the sell-off of Hydro One is a mistake, and finally commit to providing real relief for people living on a low income. And I'll repeat, because the Premier wasn't listening, they went from 1,100 people a month to 800 people a week. No, you weren't listening, Premier. Um, just a reminder that you speak to the chair, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is very important to me that we recognize that there is more that needs to be done in terms of, uh, of hydro prices, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister of Energy has said, we ha made an announcement in the throne speech that we were taking 8 per cent off people's uh, electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. We already had in place the Ontario Energy Support Program, which is targeted at exactly the people who are living on low income, Mr. Answer. Speaker, who need support. That's why that She's program is in place, answer. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, and as the uh, as the uh, Minister of Energy said, Hydro One is paying closer attention, Mr. Speaker. The fact that uh, those 1,400 people who have been cut off have been reinstated, Mr. Speaker. The company is more attuned to uh, what is going on in the community. But we know there's more to be done, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to uh, yes, we'll continue to work to find solutions. And, Mr. Speaker, I can do more than one thing at a time. <laughs> Please. Seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. People of Ontario are well aware that the Premier can multitask. She can slash, cut, and privatize all at once. Again, to the Premier. If this government was 
doing enough, then the people in Windsor wouldn't be going hungry. The mission wouldn't see an explosion in the population they serve. Essex Power Lines is installing load limiters at residences facing disconnection, allowing them to run a bare minimum amount of hydro so people can either heat or eat. That's wrong. The Keep the Heat program in Windsor has already helped more in people in 2016 than in 2015, and that number will continue to grow. While businesses, charities and nonprofits are doing all they can, this government continues to make life more difficult. Speaker, will the Premier make providing real relief from hydro bills and stopping any further sell-off of Hydro One her New Year's resolution in 2017? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I know the Premier mentioned this, but you know, yesterday Hydro One reconnected 1,400 families just to show, Mr. Speaker, that they're actually a better customer-focused company, and that's what's happening with the broadening of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. Is they're becoming customer-focused. When it comes to disconnections, Mr. Speaker, you know what? We recognize that there's more to do, and that's why we put in Bill 27 to give the OEB more power to ban all disconnections, Mr. Speaker, um, in the winter months. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker. It's sitting in front of committee because the opposition chooses not to act. They could have passed that, Mr. Speaker, with unanimous consent. We could have been making sure that that bill would have passed, Mr. Speaker, and we could have worked with the LDCs to have them implemented ASAP. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, they chose not to. We on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, recognize that we can continue to find ways to help those who are struggling, Mr. Speaker, and we've done that. 8% reduction, 20% for our rural folks, Mr. Speaker, and we've got the OESP and other programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. New question, the member from Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Associate Minister of Education for Early Years and Child Care. Minister, I'm proud of our, gov the, our government has made it a priority to improve and expand child care and early years programs in our province. In my riding of Davenport, I have heard from parents who say that demand for quality, affordable child care is great. It is encouraging to know the government is working to address the needs of Ontario families. And just earlier this morning, I was proud to stand beside the Minister of Education to announce a new community hub in my riding of Davenport, and part of that announcement was that we were indeed securing child care spaces at Bloor and Dufferin. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, my constituents would like to know what the government is doing to make sure families' needs are properly met. Thank you. Associate Minister of Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Davenport for this very important question. Speaker, I am proud that our government is making childcare a top priority. In fact, our government has created a position dedicated to early learning and childcare. Speaker, this is a clear indication that we are committed to Ontario's children and families. We are putting people first. Speaker, since we took office, we have more than doubled childcare funding to municipalities to over $1 billion a year. And the number of licensed childcare spaces in Ontario has doubled since 2003. And, Speaker, in September, we committed to doubling the number of spaces again. Over the next five years, we'll be creating space for 100,000 new children to attend childcare. And we're committing to improving and integrating our early years programs Answer. to better serve families. Speaker, we've already begun public consultations to inform our framework. In fact, I attended a consultation last night in Toronto. We've held town hall Thank meetings you. and child care. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for that, at, uh, that answer. And it's encouraging to know that you are heading to towns and cities across the province to meet with families and sector leaders. I recognize that there is a lot of work to be done, but people involved in the child care and early years sector are keen to see how the system will be modernized, and parents are eager to see these new spaces open up. The commitment of 100,000 new space, spaces in over five years. When can Ontario families expect? to see these rolling out. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer the member's question. I know families and stakeholders are excited about this, and so are we. This is a historic investment, one that will benefit all of Ontario, which is why we are moving quickly and thoroughly. As we heard recently in the fall economic statement, we've already taken our first step in creating 100,000 additional licensed childcare spaces by 2022. And we have invested an additional 
$65.5 million in this school year to support the creation of 3,400 spaces for infants, toddlers and young children. This investment promotes early learning and development while helping more parents find quality, yes, affordable care. It's the first step. We continue to build an early years and child care system that is high quality, seamless and meets the needs of parents and children. Thank you. Thank you. New question the member from Simcoe Bray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, the uh, mouth of the Nottawasaga River at Wasaga Beach has filled with sentiment, and that's made boat passage between the river and Nottawasaga Bay virtually impossible. This includes vessels operated by first responders. But worst of all, if there's a heavy thaw next spring and the mouth of the river is restricted, ice could accumulate and form a dam that potentially causes river waters, water levels to rise. This would cause flooding upstream, impacting hundreds of people. The town is earmarking $100,000 for dredging, money they shouldn't have to spend. Mr. Speaker, Wasaga Beach Council would like to know why is the municipality faced with footing the bill for dredging the river when it is a provincial responsibility? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to the member for the question. Uh, speaker, my ministry has been uh, reviewing the town's dredging work permit application, and we've been out to assess the river to assess local conditions. And speaker, through this work, my ministry has determined that there's not an imminent threat of flooding nor an emergency situation at this time. And speaker, it's it's worth noting that before any dredging takes place, an environmental assessment will need to be completed to identify potential environmental risks or effects, including impacts to lake sturgeon and other species at risk, water flows and shoreline erosion. And it's also important to note that dredging can have significant impacts. It can be highly disruptive to important habitats and natural conditions, and it's also common for a change in weather conditions Answer. to contribute to the natural process of washing out the accumulated sediment and potential further opening of the mouth of the river. Thank you. Go back to the speaker. All, all, all due respect to the uh, to the minister, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've been hearing this, blah 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 blah, for. Uh, <laughs> for several years now. The speaking notes haven't changed, no matter who the minister is over there. It's clear to everyone, including local engineers, maybe the MNR doesn't agree, but the new MNR doesn't seem to agree with any municipalities anymore. The fact of the matter is, it's clear to everybody involved, except the MNRF, uh, that, the, that it's time to dredge the river again. We've had severe flooding in the past. Right now, uh, there's nothing wrong. I'm talking about the thaw that will occur in the spring, yep. and hundreds of homes will be affected, and hundreds of thousands of people could be affected. Right so why don't we just prevent that and prevent those millions of dollars worth of damage, spend $100,000 now, do what the town wants and what everybody involved wants, get and get her done. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and respectfully to the uh, member opposite, thank you for the supplementary uh, question. But you know, due to the fact that the work permit has not yet been approved, it would be inappropriate to discuss any costs that may or may not occur out of this. But I'd also like to remind the member opposite that through our work, my ministry has determined that there's not an imminent threat of flooding nor an emergency situation as this time. If that changes, and we'll be certainly out there to reassess that. But we'll continue to work with the town, providing advice, guidance and support during the required env environmental assessment that's at work already. But I also wanted to point out that since the last time the dredging was permitted in year 2010, new information on species at risk in the river, again specifically lake sturgeon, has come to light. And because Answer. of this, it's necessary for any future dredging projects to be assessed, planned, and carried out in a way that's protective of the environment and the habitat of, of the river. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The OLG is currently in the process of putting forward a RFDQ and an RFP for a new casino operator in Niagara Falls. The way this process works, the focus is on upfront payments to the government and not on economic development, investment, job creation, and equally important job protection. Speaker, the Niagara Falls City Council has passed three unanimous resolutions, and the Niagara Regional Council recently passed another one to support it. 
Will the Premier commit today to delay the RFP and the RFPQ process to allow for it to be rewritten, given greater weight to the job creation, investment, economic development, and job protection as requested by the City of Niagara Falls and the entire Niagara region? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the member from Niagara Falls. We've had ongoing discussions about this very issue, recognizing how important it is for us to modernize Falls U and Casino Niagara as requested by Council. In fact, we established a new bundle in order for them to be able to participate in that modernization process. In fact, it's all about building and creating more jobs and helping the economy in the local community. Yep. It's why we proceeded to go this way, and again, at their request. And furthermore, we've committed to the new Niagara Entertainment Centre, which will be part of this fund, enabling even further employment and greater attraction into the community. Yep. So we are going to proceed in a transparent and fair procurement process as required and as indicated to the City Council. We'll continue to work with them, recognize how, yes, how important it is to the local community and, frankly, to the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The casinos in Niagara get up to 80 per cent of their business from the GTA. They are the biggest employer in the Niagara, with 4,000 employees and create millions of dollars in economic benefits for our province. People want to travel to Niagara because they know it's a world-class destination. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the way the RFPQ and the RFP process is being run, we know that the big-name gaming companies aren't going to bid. If they don't bid, less people will travel from Toronto, and that will put 1,500 good jobs in Niagara on the chopping block. We need to delay this process to ensure that big companies bid because we cannot afford to let 1,500 workers lose their job. Speaker, will this when the city of Ottawa, when the city of Ottawa asked for the casino RFP to be delayed, and that request was granted, Answer. will the premier follow her own lead and delay the process for the new Niagara casino operator, as requested by the city of Niagara Falls and the entire Niagara region? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, the member from Niagara Falls has just reinforced our position. We know how important it is for the local community of Niagara Falls to have an attraction like Casino Niagara, like Falls View, and like the new entertainment complex that's being put forward. Um, we also recognize how important the Ontario Lottery and Gaming is to the province of Ontario. Over $2 billion are sourced as a dividend, which goes directly to the communities. And for Niagara Falls, it's been one of essential contributions to its local economy. We want it to grow. Uh, the member is making reference to job creation and protection of jobs. Well, that's part of the uh, agreement within the RFQ as it stands now. Furthermore, we've engaged a fairness monitor to ensure the integrity of the process, that all stakeholders that are engaged in this process are acting fairly. So we have to abide by that as well. We're going to take the necessary steps to ensure the integrity Answer. and the fairness, more importantly, working very closely with the local community to provide greater economic benefit to Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good question, the member from Barry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, just recently you tabled the fall economic statement detailing the economic outlook and fiscal review for the province, where you announced changes for first-time home buyers. I often hear my, from my constituents in Barrie that they are concerned about not being able to afford their first home and that they are finding it difficult to get their foot in the front door of the property market. Uh, I, can tell, I can imagine the frustration as young people work so hard to get out of the endless cycle of paying rent. I remember how scary it was signing the check for the deposit on our first house uh, when the house only cost $28,000 in total. Things have changed. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please explain how the recent changes announced in the fall economic statement will benefit Mr. Ontario home buyers? Thank you, Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of Barry for her outstanding work and and support of her local community. We all recognize that many people have benefited from recent increases in the value of their homes, but still some young families and others looking to buy their first home are having a challenging time in getting into the housing market. That's a Tory response. Buying your first home is one of the most exciting decisions in a young person's life, but many are worried about how they'll be able to afford their first condo or their first house. So to address this, 
and to help young families, we're doubling the maximum refund for first-time homebuyers, refund from $2,000 and $4,000 starting January 1, 2017, wow. provided everybody supports this bill today, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Finance. This is an important step for first-time home buyers looking to enter the housing market. I'm pleased to hear that the government is taking steps to invest in supports that improve housing affordability and that can help people in their everyday lives. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please explain further how these changes will make a difference for first-time home buyers? Thank you, Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, and again, I'm very happy to respond to the member's question. These changes are about making it easier for young families to enter the housing market. Exactly. Uh, with these changes, no land transfer tax, the LTT, will be payable on the first $368,000 of the cost of that first home. It also means that more than half of first-time home buyers would pay no LTT at all. So, Mr. Speaker, the housing market is critically important as a source of economic growth and employment in the province of Ontario. Improving housing affordability will help more Ontarians to participate, and I look forward to the members opposite in supporting this outstanding initiative for the people of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, speaker, Simfront is a high-tech startup in eastern Ontario. A company official contacted me to express his incredible frustration with the Ontario Media Development Corp and the digital media tax credits supported by all three parties. His experience shows why Ontario's economy is struggling under this Liberal government. It took a staggering yep. 55 weeks just to process Simfront's application and confirm they're eligible for an $819,000 digital media tax credit. Wow. Over 20 weeks later, they're hearing it could be another six months before they get it. Simfront is anxious to reinvest uh, and create jobs, something we used to encourage in Ontario. Speaker, does the minister agree that two years to process a tax credit is unacceptable? And if so, why hasn't she fixed these obvious problems at an agency that's under her responsibility? Thank you. Minister Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's always my pride and pleasure to stand in this House and talk about our growing film and television sector, here, here, here. and particularly the role that the ONDC plays, an outstanding group of individuals who are helping us lead the, the world, Speaker, quite frankly, in innovation and enhance our investments in, uh, in film and television. So, I find it passing interesting on two fronts. Number one, Mr. Speaker, then thank you for your question, by the way, uh, the Honourable Member, but I find it passing interesting on two fronts. Number one, that he chose to raise this question in, in this arena rather than coming and talking to me about it, Speaker, because I would have been delighted to help him out and have my officials try and address this situation. And number two, that the party opposite has consistently not supported our investments in an industry that is leading the world, Mr. Speaker. of Education on a point of order. In my introduction this morning, I referred to the group here as AMSAC. It's actually the Ontario Student Trustee Associations. Their president, Kayvon Meehan, president, was here, along with Daisha, Nicholas, ne Nena, Tobias, Stefan, and Adet, um, Aiden, who were here this morning. So I'd thank like you. to welcome you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I know it's not a point of order, but I beg your indulgence. My daughter, Christy Nash, joined us, and my grandson, Paxson Wallace. Wow. Mr. Speaker, and uh, on a point of order, I'd like to welcome Kamisha Cox uh, from my constituency office, as well as Michelle Nugent and Tigis Zamin. Thank you, Trinity Spadina. Sure, uh, I see uh, there's another member from my. <laughs> I already acknowledged. Well, good try to, to the member across. Uh, I, I, I want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome my other, uh, the other constituent uh, assistant of my, uh, Miss uh, Diana Flari, is in the public gallery uh, with us today. Welcome. Thank you. That's the Nipperson Pepper. Just because it is the Christmas season, my grandson, our grandson, 
Leopold Gianni Michele Colucci is one year old today. The founder of Alpha Education, Flora Chong, the executive director of Alpha Education, and Dr. Karen Sarah Cleve, also for Alpha Education, here today. I want to welcome them to Queen's Park. Thank you. Minister of Education. No, I wasn't aware of this, but I understand that Viola Desmond has just uh, become the first woman yeah. in Canada to be on a banknote, and she is a, a wonderful woman who has an incredible heritage in Nova Scotia, standing up for people, and in particular, black women. So I'm just really thrilled to advise the House of that. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, for, for pointing that out. A couple of hours ago, I was able to do that, and I, I appreciate the Minister of Education announcing that. I grew up in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, and I went to that same Roseland Theatre. And today, I know I speak for the 9,080 people that still live in New Glasgow to say, um, to have Viola Desmond uh, recognized for her civil rights work and her leadership. Um, to do something that, uh, you know, there's a great quote by Margaret Mead that uh, often says, never doubt a small group of uh, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the only people that ever have. And uh, growing up in Nova Scotia, we knew who Viola Desmond and Carrie Best were because they were trailblazers. And uh, we have a significant uh, black community in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. You know, I, I, I joke that uh, there were 10,000 people when I lived there and grew up, and there's probably 9,000 there now. But the re reality is, Viola Desmond needs to be taught in our school system more uh, that she needs to be taught nationally. And the fact of the matter is, she was Rosa Parks before there was a Rosa Parks. And this is a great day for Canadian women and uh, for all Canadians. Deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 45, an act to amend certain acts with respect to provincial elections. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
members, please take your seats. December 7, 2016, Mr. Nack, we move third reading of Bill 45, an act to amend certain acts with respect to provincial elections. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Souza, Mr. Souza, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Duga, Mr. Duga, Ms. McCharles, Ms. McCharles, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Baradnetti, Mr. Baradnetti, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leal, Mr. Leal, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Orzetti, Mr. Orzetti, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, Mrs. Manga, Mrs. Manga, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Madame Lalonde. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Bisson. Ms. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Shimanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 92, the nays are zero. The ayes being 92 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do not pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading, Bill 70, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Call in the members, this will be a five minute bell. Third reading of Bill 70, an act to implement budget measures to enact amend in various statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. 
Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Darmelon. Ms. Darmelon. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to recognize that. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Hemp. Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gates. Gretzky. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 51, the nays are 40. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be resolved that the bill be now passed and the entitlement of the motion. I, I do, uh, before I entertain a, uh, a, a motion, uh, I would like to uh, say to you, that it's the last day for our pages. No! And, uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank the pages very much for all the work that they've done. to come back on December 25th, so we'll have to see what happens. I'm not sure that. Anyway, I'd like to uh, recognize the government house leader on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Her honour awaits.
it. Your Honor, the Legislative Assembly of the province has at present meetings therefore passed certain bills to which, in the name and on behalf of said Legislative Assembly, I respectfully request Your Honor's assent. Are the title of the bills to which your honour's assent is prayed? An act to amend or repeal various acts with respect to housing and planning. Loi modifiant ou abrogeant diverses lois en ce qui concerne le logement et le management du territoire. An act to amend the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care Act. Loi modifiant la loi sur le ministre de la Santé et des soins de longue durée. An act to proclaim Hazel McCallion Day. Loi proclamant le jour de Hazel McCallion. An act to amend the Children's Law Reform Act with respect to the relationship between the child and the child's grandparents. Loi modifiant la loi portant reform du droit de l'enfance en ce qui concerne la relation entre un enfant et ses grands-parents. An act to proclaim the month of November as Albanian Heritage Month. Loi proclamant le mois de novembre, mois du patrimoine albanais. An act to amend various acts in the interest of patient-centered care. Loi modifiant diverses lois dans l'intérêt des soins axés sur les patients. An act to proclaim Panda Pans Awareness Day. Loi proclamant la journée de sensibilisation aux Panda Pans. An act to proclaim the month of March as Bangladeshi Heritage Month. Loi proclamant le mois de mars, mois de patrimoine Bangladesh. An act to amend certain acts with respect to provincial elections. Loi visant à modifier certaines lois en ce qui concerne les élections provinciales. An act to amend the Consumer Protection Act 2002 with respect to reward points. Loi modifiant la loi de 2002 sur la protection du consommateur en ce qui a trait au point de récompense. An act to proclaim the month of November, Hindu Heritage Month. Loi proclamant le mois de novembre, mois de patrimoine hindou. An act to proclaim Nurse Practitioner Week. Loi proclamant la semaine des infirmières practiciennes et infirmiers practiciennes. An act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Loi visant à mettre en œuvre les mesures budgétaires et à édicter et modifier diverses lois. An act to revive Computers Mean Business Inc. An act to revive Ranger Survey Systems Canada Inc. In Her Majesty's name, Her Honor Lieutenant Governor doth assent to these bills. Au nom de Sa Majesté, son honneur, la lieutenant gouverneur sanctionne ces projets de loi. Speaker, with your permission, may I, on behalf of all Ontarians, thank each and every member of this House for the service and the dedication they have provided in the name of the citizens of this province. And may I wish all of you a very joyous holiday season and a peaceful year to come. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to uh, echo the Lieutenant Governor and, and thank each and every one of you for the service that you give to the province of Ontario. I wish for you a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and all of the blessings that the season brings to you and your family. I wish for you some rest. I wish for you peace. I also want to re-emphasize time and time again the amount of work that you do, an awful lot of unseen work time away from your family. The work that you do in your constituency offices is second to none. I'm so proud of this group. Thank you. Merry Christmas. There are no further bills or anything else to do at this moment. So this house stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.